What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Welcome in. It is good to see you, and it's good to be seen. Uh, here on the InsideCarolina.com Coast to Coast podcast, I am, of course, your host, Joey Powell. We are brought to you by Johnny T. Shirt. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you kicking off your summer here on the Coast to Coast podcast, where, you know, I have been told and I have seen on garments that there is no off season, And we're going to continue to deliver the news and discussion that you have come to expect from us here on the Coast to Coast. With me, as always, the two guys that make this show what it is that you are here to see. Uh, fresh off the West Coast, where I assume it's a million degrees like it is everywhere else. Sean Moran. Sean, how are you? Doing well. Uh, cool 70, 75 today. So no I hate complaints. You. you are the worst. Uh, and returning from uh, following uh, Alicia Keys on her tour through Peru over the last couple of weeks, Sherelle McMillan. Sherelle, how are you? I'm good. I thought it was Medea goes to a NASCAR race I was auditioning for. I did not that, get the part, by the way. That was two weeks ago. You didn't get it? Did you, <clears throat> yeah. Didn't even get a call back? Well, no, nothing. So, wow. very disappointing. Yeah. Wow. So, no hallelujah for you. Um, no. Man, I appreciate you guys being here. Let's get rolling. Got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, again, if you are watching or listening, which I guess is the only really two ways you can consume this show, uh, make sure you stop and give us a rating and a review. Really appreciate it. Also want to say that I really appreciate I uh, really appreciated being able to talk it, talk to and, and see and, and meet some of our listeners and subscribers um, recently out and about. I uh, saw some folks at the Bosch this past weekend. Of course, the Diamond Heels saw their season in just a little bit ago. Uh, just a tough weekend for those guys. And, and as great of a run as they had, I think they just ran into a team that played a little deeper this weekend. But it was nice to see and meet some of the listeners of this show uh, and subscribers to Inside Carolina at the Bosch this weekend. So shout out to those folks. Boys, why don't we get started with uh, some international discussion? Uh, first things first, Sean, USA Basketball U18s. We talked about it a lot on the last show that we did here, and it was because two UNC um, commits had, or one signee and one commit had been named to the final roster. So you've had a chance to watch these guys as they've played in Mexico. Uh, what can you tell us about how they fared? Specifically, uh, let's start with Seth Trimble. Sure. So, so right now uh, they're going into the, the gold medal game against Brazil uh, tonight, Sunday. And as we, we talked about last time, uh, there's not a lot of competition. And we, we saw that in the, in the pool play where USA was, was winning by 30 to 80, 80 points. Uh, and they actually got a little bit of a scare early on in the, the quarterfinals against Mexico, who was 0-3. And uh, I know Sherelle was watching as well, and they, they started out down in the first quarter, only scoring 10 points, but they they caught up and and went ahead. Uh, so the team itself is is really talented and deep. Everybody has been, been getting a lot of playing time. Seth Trimble has been uh, playing pretty well coming off the bench. He's averaging uh, just around 10 points per game through five games. Uh, in the semifinals, he had uh, 16. So he's... There, there's, I'd say there's nothing, nothing new or nothing that uh, is being is being shown that we haven't seen. I think there are really his strengths coming to light just in terms of his athletic uh, athletic ability. Uh, when he does attack, uh, one his ability off of two feet, uh, but two the body control and his uh, skill using his left hand. So I think those, especially the semifinal game, were were shown at full strength. Uh, he's been playing off ball, I'd say 75, 80%, if not more of the time um, with, uh, with a few of the other point guards controlling, controlling the game. So he, sometimes he's been more on the, on the wings, kind of in spot up and, and drive situations, uh, playing a little bit of a backup point guard. But so far he's been, I'd say, extremely, extremely strong. Um, a few things that I've noticed defensively, uh, fantastic on ball defender. I think we we've seen that in high school and AAU and should be something we, we see early on in Chapel Hill, but also off the ball. He's, he's always aware of what's going on. Seems to have a good understanding of, of where the other opponents are going to be uh, in the half court set and whether he needs to switch or get through uh, or, or where he needs to be a help side. That's definitely, he's definitely uh, shown a good awareness on, on that aspect. And then from a rebounding ability, since he hasn't been playing the point, uh, he has been looking to crash the boards offensively and then defensively uh, just grab, grab and go. So he's been playing, playing very well so far. And I think uh, he'll, he'll definitely be a factor off the bench for UNC uh, in, a, in a few months. I love that you mentioned his strength because that was, again, you've watched a lot more of his, of his game than I have. But 
seeing some of the clips and the cutups from uh, the, this U18 run, that's the first thing that jumps out at me is that the kid looks strong and I feel like he plays big. Not that he goes and posts up, but he plays like he knows he's stronger than the guys across from him. Cheryl, anything you want to add about, uh, about Trimble's play in Mexico? No, I think Sean said it best. The, the defensive side has just been really impressive. I know you guys talked with Fink last week about that, um, just how he could be kind of the head of the snake defensively. And I think you're seeing that with Team USA because in those events, to Sean's point, the, the talent gap is so huge um, that you really don't have to run a lot of stuff because you, you create your offense from your defense. And you can tell by their scoring outputs that they're, you know, turning other teams over and Trimble a lot of times is, is one of those causes. So I think it just says a lot about what he can do defensively, even in the ACC next season. <clears throat> and that is uh, uh, very helpful for UNC just because if you have someone who can come in and play 15 minutes a game and their sole job is to harass the, the person who initiates the offense from the other team, that's pretty valuable um, because it, it can save Caleb, it can save RJ, and it can get into the legs of the opposing guard. So I think that's my biggest takeaway is just seeing his defense, again, applied in a different setting and seeing how valuable it is. Yeah, and I love that you're pointing out the different setting angle of things too. I think anytime you these guys see something different, uh, you have a chance to, to see – uh, maybe a little bit more versatility from them, even if it's not a new skill set like Sean was saying earlier. Sean, you're talking about Gigi Jackson. I know he's uh, he's been somewhat limited, but he has had a chance to play uh, in the first two games and posted some nice numbers considering. Yeah, he played in the first two games and it was was definitely disappointing uh, to see him have to sit out uh, really after that that second game. Uh, I think a, a sinus infection was the the main cause. That second game, he did finish with with 20 points, and he, he did a lot of that late. Uh, USA was up, but he still put together uh, in, in the fourth quarter. There's a, a little stretch where defensively he got switched out into a guard, stole the ball, you know, went in for, went in for a transition, uh, got a rebound the next next one, kind of alley oop, and then he had uh, uh, the dunk. Probably everybody's seen uh, on Twitter and and YouTube the the windmill on the on the break. So. Uh, I mean, 20 points, especially when you're with a team as talented as this one is, you're not really, not many people are scoring above, above 15, 15 points in these games. So uh, I think for him, and we talked about it with, with Adam was the different roles that he's been asked to play from high school to AU and, and now on this USA team. And I think he's been, was able to fit in very well in those two games uh, with that versatility, uh, rebounding the ball uh, extremely well. And, and getting more comfortable in that second game from a scoring output uh, where he did knock down a little mid-range, a little mid-range jump shot as well. It, it was just disappointing not to be able to see him continue on because I'm sure he would have been able, I don't think he would have been scoring 20 every game, but I think just more so continuing to see the growth and his ability, especially against Mexico in the quarterfinals where they they went to a one, three, one zone mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. And, and just seeing how that, those, those uh, match matchups would have worked. So overall, a strong performance. Uh, it just left kind of a sour taste seeing how well he played in that second game and then him having to sit out uh, the next at least three games. We don't know he'll, if he'll play tonight in the gold medal game. Yeah, uh, I love the versatility that I've been seeing from this kid. And something else that I keep seeing and it keeps just flashing on and off like a great neon light inside of my head. Trail, you can talk me out of this if you want. I see a lot of Marvin Williams, not necessarily in his skill set and not because they're both 6'9 and are very highly touted players, but he seems like such a good teammate. Cheryl, am I way off base there? Is it is he really got a lot of those strong Marvin Williams vibes or am I just being an old guy? No, for sure. And I, I think that's one of the draws to North Carolina. Obviously, he's immensely talented, but there's a lot of immensely talented jerks out there who, who <laughs> don't want on your team. And I think that's part of the equation that Hubert Davis did when he offered him um, not quite a year ago, uh, was that in addition to being a player on the rise, he also was someone who would fit culturally into what UNC likes to do and what UNC wants from its players. So I think you're, you're spot on there. And I think the comparison, honestly, <clears throat> excuse me, even on the court, isn't terrible uh, just because just like Marvin, we, you know, Eric's talked about it. We've talked about it. What's best for him long term is probably going to be different from what's best for him to do for North Carolina in his likely one season. Um, so you saw Marvin every once in a while, he would take a three, but mostly he was down on the block and, and kind of doing 
you know, his business from there. And I think you'll see similar from Gigi. And to Sean's point, that's why it was really fascinating to see or think about how he would fit on to this, this USA team and a lot of small ball five more than I think maybe anyone expected. <laughs> um, but that's, that's how he's successful at UNC. The things that he did with team USA, I think is what UNC will need from him most. So that's why it was to Sean's point, you feel kind of cheated of those last three games because you want to see how it would progress, you know, throughout the tournament. One thing I will say is if I hear Hubert Davis telling a story about him handing out water to his teammates uh, when he's out of a game, I'm going to absolutely start just just showing off for you guys. Um, all right. So anything else we want to talk about with the USAB performances? Again, I think it's it's been really good. There's plenty of YouTube video out there for uh, our listeners and subscribers if they want to see it, if they haven't seen it yet. Uh, by the time you hear this, you know, the gold medal game will be over with. But Sean, is there anything else we need to to address before we move on to the next subject? I think the only thing regarding regarding Trimble, uh, he's been able to get to the line a lot right now, uh, 14 out of 17, I believe. So he's been been shooting pretty pretty well from the the free throw line. Uh, from the from outside three point, he's he's two of seven. Uh, so I think that that's the the one thing that we've continuously been talked about or have been talking about over the last really year in terms of how does his outside shooting uh, play in once he gets gets to Chapel Hill and. I think the shots don't look bad uh, that you would say, oh, no, he's a poor shooter. So I think there's definitely stuff to work with. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there have been a handful of times where he's been wide open, kind of ready to shoot, and just the ball hasn't swung his way. But once again, I think that's really the, that last piece of the puzzle to unlock his full potential. Because uh, once he gets to school, that'll help teams from sagging off of him or going under pick and rolls. And now, uh, it, it just op- will open up his game if he can if he can slightly increase that three point percentage from what he was in in high school. Sure. Anything else you want to tack on before we head to the uh, head to the transfer portal a little bit? No, nah, I think Sean nailed it. Man, that's two props from Sherelle for Sean. Man, must really be <laughs> in a in a great mood, especially coming to us from his new podcast headquarters after uh, after relocating uh, after being following uh, Alicia Keys' tour around in Peru. That was that's impressive. Guy's been busy. All right, speaking of busy, uh, one of the things I think that we talked about last time we are recently when we did a show about uh, about the transfer portal, you know, we talked about kind of the three options that we felt like uh, were potential fits for North Carolina. And at the time, it was uh, Matthew Meyer, uh, Pete Nance, and uh, Pat Baldwin Jr. Well, as we know, Matthew Meyer is committed to Illinois, um Baldwin Jr. is staying in the draft and I still think he's probably going to go late first round somebody he's just too talented not to uh but Pete Nance uh is still moving on from uh Northwestern and has taken his name out of the draft obviously this is probably not news to folks listening to the show but just trying to reset everything here one of the takeaways from our last uh, podcast when we talked about the transfer portal was that uh, we felt like of all those three guys that Matthew Mayer was or Matthew Meyer was probably the best fit of those three options. Uh, well, now Nance seems to be the only guy left. And Sean, to give you a chance, since you've had a chance to watch him a little bit more, um, give you a chance to talk about his game a little bit more. And I want to stress, we don't know anything else about where he's going to go if he's talking more with North Carolina. Uh, there's just, you know, he's not talking. His camp isn't talking. And folks that know don't seem to be willing to speak either. Am I wrong on that, Cheryl? I think that's pretty fair. Uh, the stuff we have been able to glean, you can check out on from the weekly scoop this past week. So yeah, there's some stuff, but it's just it's hard confirming things when when certain folks won't talk. So yeah, it takes takes two people to have a conversation. So uh, Sean, do you want to say anything after you've had a chance to watch a little bit more of his game and and see some of the results from the uh, from the combine? Sure. I think when we when we last chatted about the transfer portal, I would have, if I was a betting man, I would have bet money that he would not have been uh, coming coming back to school. Whether that was trying to stick it out on a a two way or exhibit ten or even go overseas, where I could have seen him being uh, extremely coveted, just given the size and and shooting ability. But here we are, uh, Nance announcing that he is coming back. In the last podcast. The main concern was was the fit for him. Uh, I think when we looked at Meyer, we just were looking at Brady Manick and and how do you ha- have somebody that that can come in and maybe replace him? And one of the comments was uh, for Nance, m- maybe he would have been the perfect fit if Armando uh, wasn't around as a, as a 
coming back for his senior year, just given his size and, and what he did at Northwestern. Having watched him a little bit more, there's still, I'd say, definite concerns at the four, um, especially defensively, given that he is a, I'd say, a, a five, five, four last year at Northwestern, predominantly played the five offensively and defensively. Uh, the Wake Forest game was one of the game, full games I watched just to see if he matched up with LaRavia at all, which he didn't. Um, and I know LaRavia gave Manic a lot of trouble. Um, they both gave each other trouble in, in that game. But uh, for him, I guess a, a few things. One, I know it's been on the message boards of what would happen if Armando gets in foul trouble or for whatever reason gets gets injured. And I think especially with a team that's trying to win a championship, this would be the perfect uh, fit in terms of a, a being able to play almost a backup five or play that five role. Obviously, they'd lose a little bit, but here you have an extremely talented player filling that versus somebody that is trying to do that for the first time. Uh, but also, you're not bringing him in just to be a backup. You bring him in to start him next to Armando. And I think from an offensive perspective, he, he it's predominantly is, is operating in, in pick and roll, pick and pop situations, uh, shooting, uh, catch and shoot situations as well. Uh, he can can score in the post off the block, but he's most comfortable catching and shooting. He will, you know, if, if he has the opportunity, he will he will do a, a straight line drive uh, if the defense is playing him too tight. So he moves a little better than I, I expected last time. I still think he's, he's a little tight, a little stiff, which is defensively, I think that's probably the one area of concern uh, when you're trying to match up, especially a smaller, quicker four, uh, and for them to start trying to isolate uh, both Armando and and Pete and Ants at the same time. So that would be still the the main area uh, in terms of how does that fit in. But also from a personality and chemistry standpoint, I think if he does come in, it would be easier than than Meyer. Uh, I, I think also easier for Puff and and Styles to accept that, given he is more of a five four rather than their exact position. And, and I think. Just from watching him play, he's he's pretty quiet on the court, just goes about and does his business. And I think that could be easier when you're returning uh, kind of alpha dogs and Caleb Love and RJ Davis and Armando, who have been here two, three years and are ready for this really final final run. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but those are just a few thoughts from watching him a little bit more over the past few weeks. Yeah, I think something to think about with Nance is he's had a, a small – much smaller amount of, of success playing or coming from Northwestern than uh, somebody like Meyer would have having been on a national championship team at Baylor. So your chemistry point there, I think, is a, is a strong one. Uh, Sherelle, anything you want to share in about how Nance might fit chemistry-wise with this roster? I mean, I feel like Sean's kind of leading us to some good spots. Anything else you want to you wanna add on top of the pizza? No, not particularly. Uh, I, Sean laid it out you know, pretty well. Um, that's three, Sean. In, that's a hat trick. <laughs> in that uh, he's, he's someone who I think um, he just doesn't seem to have the mentality of, you know, I want to come in and, and I, let me, let me be clear. I don't know this for a fact. This is from reading tea leaves and <laughs> like, you know, going in the backyard and, you know, throwing some sage out and trying to figure things out that way. Um, but he doesn't seem like the type based on talking to some people around who will come in and disrupt things and not saying that other people who tra- who potentially might have transferred in would have, but we know with him that that's unlikely to be the case, whether or not he picks you and see, um, I think offensively the, the chemistry I think could be, really really good because he is a, he's an adept passer and i think we've if anything not comparing him to brady manic but if we saw anything last year was that when north carolina was at its best is when you know the ball was moving mm-hmm. and the ball would keep moving with nance in the game and then his ability to shoot will open things up so there's a lot to like especially on the offensive end i think like sean said the question mark is just how kind of would work defensively and you know would would supercharging the offense potentially be worth it to maybe take a step back on defense or um, be the same on defense as you were last year. So, um, but they would, you know, obviously they would love to have him. So it's just a matter of seeing what's going to happen. And the thing is, he doesn't have to commit anywhere. He doesn't have to no. sign a letter of intent. He could, if he really, really wanted to, just show up and enroll, you know, in August <laughs> and be ready for his fall practice. At, at his college of choice. Absolutely. Right. Now, I, I will say we do expect, uh, you know, I think they're 
would be closure from a UNC perspective one way or another in the next couple of weeks because the second summer session starts um, in about 10 days. And usually that's when everyone is there for UNC, the entire team, they have practices, you know, they start the process of getting ready for the season. So it'd be very hard for someone to come in in, you know, September and yeah. really kind of get things going. So I think one way or another from a UNC perspective, we'll know within the next, you know, I'd say 10 days or so. Yeah, I would create an entire new litany of, of chemistry issues that Sean was just trying to talk away. So I uh, definitely don't see that happening. But all right, again, I, we know this is a hot topic on the message boards. We know that a lot of Inside Carolina premium subscribers uh, and, and listeners of this show both have have really been curious about where this is going. It's not that we're holding anything back. It's not that we're sitting on anything. We just there's there's nothing really to report, at least that that we feel comfortable confirming. Um, so just hang tight, obviously, as, as we find things out or if anything materializes one way or another with Pete Nance, uh, you know, Sherelle and and the rest of the reporting staff from IC will be all over it. So just hang tight and bear with us. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about a mission ago when I'm, you know, I was talking about the chance of, of getting to meet some of our listeners, our subscribers. I really do appreciate that. Um, and somebody said to me the other day, like, hey, I know who you are. I'm like, all right, I'm I'm not important. I wasn't just in an episode, not, not in an edition of the Slammer magazine that you see at your local convenience store. Um, but they pointed out the Johnny T-shirt gear that I was wearing to the baseball game. Think about that. I was actually wearing a UNC baseball shirt that came from our friends at Johnny T-shirt. And, uh, you know, if, if, if the Tar Heels had advanced this weekend and made it to Omaha, Johnny T-shirt would have College World Series shirts with the Tar Heel logo on them. Unfortunately, that will not be available for folks because uh, the heels fell just short. But you can still go to Johnny T-shirt and get something else. You can still get good Johnny T-shirt gear. You can still get ready for football season. You can still get a shirt to celebrate the, you know, uh, lacrosse, uh, the Women's Lacrosse National Championship. You could still get a shirt to celebrate the ACC Baseball Championship, the Tar Heels won. All kinds of stuff. Johnny T-shirt's got it. We appreciate them supporting this show and supporting Inside Carolina. We hope that you will also uh, support them. You still got a couple of days before Father's Day. It's a week from today. I mean, if, if you listen to this show and get on johnnytshirt.com, you could order your gear, and I would bet you, I would bet you they could probably get it to you in time to give it to that father in your life that you really appreciate. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe for Father's Day, um, Mark Williams will get Caleb Love a T-shirt from Johnny T-shirt, right? Just to, <laughs> just, just to say, hey, you're my daddy. Here's a nice gift from Johnny T-shirt. Uh, but we hope you'll continue to support Johnny T-shirt the way to support us. We'll hit a break right now. Let some national guys pay some ads. We'll be right back to talk a little bit more about some of the new Kids showing up on the block for UNC basketball as the freshman report to campus. You're listening to the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. All right, thanks for sticking around. I'm Joey Powell with me as always on the Coast to Coast. Sean Moran, Cheryl McMillan. Uh, guys, we've talked a little bit about uh, USA basketball. We've talked a little bit about uh, you know transfer portal options or option singular. Something now that is, is Sherelle mentioned a second ago about second summer session, why does that matter to – Carolina basketball fans, well, you're starting to see the noobs show up. And uh, I think, Sherelle, you said that uh, Nickel and, um, oh, God, Washington would be showing up. God, this, this, is, this is dad brain. Uh, Nickel and Washington will be showing up on campus, and then uh, obviously South Trimble will, will join after he finishes up his USA basketball duties. Uh, what can you tell us about what that process is going to look like when those kids get here and, and how you expect them to get acclimated to, to kind of just being a part of Carolina basketball? Yeah, so they're coming in. Uh, most of them, they were set to arrive today. Uh, Trimble, excuse me, uh, uh, Jalen Washington. See, I did it to you too. I'm Tyler sorry. Nich yeah, yeah, <laughs> you did it to me too. Jalen Washington and Tyler Nichols set to arrive today. And it's it's a great time to arrive because uh, Carolina basketball camp starts today. And so they'll be there and they'll go through orientation. And um, there's, a, there's an acclimation period that they have to go through before they can do anything on the court or in the weight room or anything like that. So they'll have that. Um, and just being around when pros and former players are around, it's a great time to be in Chapel Hill um, we, uh, around the basketball program. So they ex they'll experience that, <clears throat> and then you know they'll they'll get to work uh, with trying to for nickel more than likely playing pickup you know with the guys and getting into a rhythm and and getting with Jonas and really hitting that hard. Jalen, I would suspect um, he will be more with Jonas and and rehab. Um, I think the chances of him 
or likelihood of him playing pickup this summer is about 0.0001%. (laughs) (laughs) You never say never, but like it's very, very unlikely um, just because they want him to be ready for the season. Um, It'll be a year in September, basically when practice starts in September, it'll be a year since his surgery. So that's a good amount of time for him to get himself uh, back together. And then Trimble, as you said, is down in Mexico right now as we're talking, finishing up with USA. Um, he's going to go home for a couple of days because, uh, you know, he's had a lot. They lost, um, he lost his maternal grandmother a mm-hmm. couple of weeks ago, right before they left for USA. So they haven't really had a graduation celebration. So they're going to do all of that um, when he goes back home for a couple of days. And then he's expected in, in Chapel Hill, I think Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so they'll all be there and they'll enroll and start classes on the 20th, I believe and just kind of start their indoctrination into everything that is UNC basketball. And a lot of that is just being around at the camps and seeing how all the other guys do things. That's a, it's a great start, um, you know, to, to learn Chapel Hill and to learn Carolina. I think it's safe to say that this incoming class has probably got more resources around it just with regard to uh, upperclassmen being here, guys that have been in the program for a long time. I mean, we're not even you know mentioning Will Shaver, who got a full you know a full year, almost a year under his belt uh, before he's going to be called on to play. I feel like you know we've talked about many other times on this show about building depth within the program. I think these guys are walking in to campus and walking into that locker room probably with more established stuff around them than any class in a long time. Sean, you feel like that's that's an okay assessment? Is there another class you can think of? No, and, and I think that's what we've all been hoping for, for, for the last few years of, of where th- these freshmen are not expected to to come in and, and save the world, but they're, they're here to come in and, and play a role and, and contribute with an upper-class team. I think really probably going back to 20, 2019, where you had some of the guys, some of the returners coming in and, and some of those guys as uh, Kobe, et cetera. But over the last few years, that's really been the missing, the missing piece was there wasn't that, uh, the, the starters that were returning or the, the impact players that were returning and, and have a nice integration. And we talked about Baylor uh, earlier with Meyer and that's, that's what they've had over the last few years. And even when they lost everybody after the championship, they still had a lot of the guys in the wings uh, coming up. And now Carolina is finally back at that, at that point in time. And hopefully it can, um, you know, now just continue in terms of adding and not wholesale roster changes, but, I think that'll make things a lot easier at the beginning of the year. People are familiar with the system. Uh, even the even the players that, that didn't play are familiar with it. Uh, so I think once practice starts, they'll probably be able to go at a much uh, faster pace than they than they did last year with everybody still trying to get acclimated with with a new coaching system, new roles, et cetera. So I, I think that is one of the big benefits of of this year and and having that having that as an opportunity uh, going into the fall. Appreciate that. Shrill, I want to ask mainly because I'm the host and I can uh, refresh for me what the rules are about uh, coaches contact with guys playing pickup and how much you know this team can be around each other, how much involvement the staff can have. And I do mean things like, you know, what's Jonas's hour limitation or what's the you know, how often can the coaches see these guys over, over the summer? Yeah, there's a number. I can't get it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Honestly. I, I should have teed no, you up better. That's, that's no, a bad it's, host. It's fine, but they, they cannot watch pickup. So that's one thing. Now, obviously, you know, Armando can come back and say, oh, DeMarco looked great. Or, <laughs> oh, Tyler was awesome. You know, they can, they, they have that, but they can't be out there watching. Um, there's a certain amount of instruction they can do per week. It, it's a few hours. I can't, again, I can't remember the exact number. And then I think there's four or five practices that they can have during the course of the summer. UNC just typically chooses to do it during the second session and kind of get it all in there before everybody heads home at the end of July. Um, So, I mean, since we're mentioning that, we kind of just go through the schedule. So there's camp for the next four days. There's a day off. Then there's another camp. uh, And then the second session starts. That's when that conditioning work and that school work with the assistant coaches and Hebert Davis and the practices will start. The second session ends, uh, like I said, at the end of July. Players typically go home. <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over some sickness. The players typically go home for a week or two in August. And when they come back, that's when the kind of grueling uh, conditioning that, you know, Coach Smith and then Ro Williams and <laughs> now Hebert Davis have instituted with, with Jonas over the years. And that will lead up to 
um, fall practice, which starts 42 days before the season um, begins, which typically is that last week in September. That's a, that's a lot. And, and, you know, as we sit here in, in, in June, the middle of June, talking about basketball, this will creep up on us. So when uh, let's folks listen to this show, you know, hear us talking about, about roster changes and all this kind of stuff. And it, when, when we get into the fall, remember me saying it's going to creep up on you, but it's, usually, it's usually each year. It's like, I think football game four is yeah. right around the time when basketball starts. And it's like, how did that happen? And every year we always say amongst the three of us are like, where the hell did the summer go? Mm-hmm. Um, but I appreciate you laying that out for us. Uh, moving on to some recruiting news. Uh, Cheryl, you got some other dates on the calendar that are, that are pretty important specifically with, this coming Wednesday, uh, coaches are allowed to start contacting uh, kids in the 24 class, and then a live scholastic evaluation begins on Friday. Why does that matter to Carolina fans? Yeah, so it could be a busy week for, for Carolina coaches. In addition to the Carolina camp, um, you know, on Wednesday the 15th, so juniors, we'll, we'll call them juniors, rising juniors if you want to call them, people who were sophomores last year, they can get direct contact from coaches for the first time. What does that mean? That is – you know, Hubert Davis can call Jaron Stevenson an offered player from 2024 directly. As it stands now, Jaron could call Hubert Davis, but Hubert Davis can't call Jaron. Hubert Davis can call Jaron's parents. They can, he can call the high school coach. He can call the AAU coach, but he cannot call Jaron directly. That changes on June 15th. If you recall last year, uh, Gigi Jackson was one of Hubert Davis's first calls. And he called him during the day at like two or three o'clock and was like, hey, we really like you, want to recruit you, et cetera, et cetera. And Gigi was kind of confused, like, oh, where's my offer? And then Hubert Davis called back that night and offered him a scholarship. So <laughs> to the point, um, you know, he can just call freely, whereas before that would have had have to have been worked out with the parents or a coach or something. So that's one of the reasons it's important. And you kind of get a good feel um, for who uh, the coach is like in a class or who they're initially kind of targeting. So that's important to look at. And again, North Carolina has two offers out in 2024. Uh, uh, Jaron Stevenson from Pittsburgh and then Cam Scott from down in Lexington, South Carolina. However, there is another player who is um, scheduled, according to him, to visit UNC later this week. Uh, Jason Asamota is a uh, wing from, he's from Boston, but he goes to Hillcrest Hillcrest Prep in uh, uh, Arizona. So he uh, has said that he's scheduling uh, an unofficial visit to UNC next weekend he doesn't have an offer yet um, but it does seem like the visit is likely to happen Um, so we'll kind of see what happens from there yeah and as we've learned very rarely does a kid show up on campus and not either leave with an offer or have an offer before he gets here because that's just at that point it just feels like both the staff and the and the player's family and the player are wasting time right right yeah and so then uh, Friday begins the scholastic evaluation period. And what is that? That is not AU. So basically what happened was, I think a, a few years ago, I think it's been, this is like the third or fourth year. Again, excuse me, I'm getting over something. <laughs> and I think it's the third or fourth year that uh, coaches were kind of frustrated because high school had kind of been taken out of the mm-hmm. recruiting process because yeah, you go see a guy during the fall, you know, with his high school team, but you don't really interact with him that much. Um, and there wasn't, it was all grassroots all summer. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to hit that meat button. And basically what it is, is that it's a chance for players to play with their high school team during the summer. Coaches can evaluate only public schools. None of the big national schools um, can participate in it. So it's a, it's a good deal. Yeah, UNC saw RJ Davis and others there. It's really important. All right. Well, I will let you go collect your, lung capacity while <laughs> while we try to dig into this a little bit more um sean i know you've done a good job kind of watching some of these guys just what do you think unc's needs are going to be in this class i mean i, I think we've started seeing hubert davis love shooters he loves guys that can play the three or four or two or somewhere if not some combination of all three of those positions uh, what do you anticipate being unc's biggest needs out of this class I think definitely, definitely the wing spot. I mean, anywhere really from uh, the two to four, uh, and the four being a the Jaron Stevenson prototype of mm-hmm. of somebody that say more of a modern modern day four four three. Uh, but you can see whether it's Cam Scott or some of the other uh, strong players within North Carolina and the surrounding states, what they've been focused on, and that really is that 
that wing, uh, that wing persona, uh, from a point guard, lead guard perspective. I think once again, there's, you can't really assume anything these days, but ideally you're looking at potentially RJ and, and Trimble coming back, uh, you know, and then you have Wilcher in the wing as well. So I, I think it really is who's, who can, who can help them from a perimeter standpoint. And then we'll see how Washington looks. Cause that could be another, uh, another position that is maybe secondary to what their initial focus is for that 2024 class. Awesome. Appreciate you giving us that insight. Um, and then anything, Sherelle, you, you also want to add about that, um, you know, the, the changes in the recruiting calendar or the, I'm sorry, not the changes, but the developments on the recruiting calendar this week, anything else you want to throw in there? Yeah. Just without coughing this time, I'm going to talk much slower. So I don't, uh, inflame my lungs, but to Sean's point, um, I do think watching, you know, bigs is, is something that we need to look out for. Mm-hmm. They're going to expand their, their 2024 20, radar. They just haven't done it yet. Um, so this is really the first chance for them to, to really, really, uh, kind of go there. Like they were able to watch guys in April, but it's been, you know, it's good, a good five or six weeks since they've been able to watch guys live. So a player can change. There's been guys who have come up and, and had great performances who they might probably want to watch again. So I, I think we should definitely um, keep that in mind. And then, you know, there's tournaments all throughout the country. And like I said, Mount Verde and Oak Hill and IMG and schools oh, yeah. like that, you know, can't participate. So you take out <clears throat> those guys who they've seen and it allows some freedom to maybe go see a, a player you hadn't seen before. Cam Whitmore, for example, last year, they hadn't mm-hmm. seen him before the Scholastic Live period. Tyler Nickel, they hadn't seen him before the Scholastic Live period. So it's definitely a chance to, to see talent. And, you know, North Carolina offered both of those scholarships and ended up with one of them from that time last year. So it could happen again. Uh, and, and as always, if there is a confirmed offer uh, given out by the UNC staff and, and I seek confirm it, you know, Sherelle will do a really good write-up on it, and you can find them on the South Carolina Premium Message Boards. So look for a lot of that. All right, last little bit of news we want to mention here. Um, uh, Maris Bozelis, who has popped up on UNC's 23 radar a little bit, uh, he has at least you know announced where he's going to be going to school uh, next year. Sherelle, you want to you want to break that news for everybody? Not college, yes. by the way. His his <laughs> high school. Yes, where we we'll be playing high school next year. Good safe. Uh, Sunrise Christian Academy in Kansas. Uh, I believe his brother actually plays there now. So he's transferring there. You know, he was obviously in New Hampshire last year. Um, before that was was home in Chicago. So um, a new start for him. From a UNC perspective, obviously he's kind of the top remaining target in the 2023 class. Um, as of now, haven't heard anything about confirmed visit dates or anything like that. So you kind of wonder just how, uh, and you know, how serious UNC can be taken in his recruitment if uh, it doesn't get a visit. But honestly, that's another one that's just kind of very tight-lipped. And, you know, anyone who tells you they know exactly what's going on is probably just guessing. Um, because, or their last name is Bazilis. <laughs> or exactly, exactly. <laughs> that, there you go. There you go. Um, so uh, just kind of have to watch that one and see how it progresses over the next, you know, month or so. All right. Appreciate the update as always there. And, you know, folks that are listening to this, they know, but I'm going to, you know, repeat it just for my sanity. If there is news to be broken, you will find it on InsideCarolina.com. We will put it either, there'll be a message board post about it and Shrill will do a really good write-up or Ben or, or Ross or Greg or anybody from the writing staff. Uh, there will be a write-up about it. Sean will probably do a really good in-depth analysis of their game. So just keep your eyes peeled for it as you always do. I know folks, but just want to reiterate that for you. Uh, boys, before we get out of here today, is there anything else you want to add to our deliciousness of this show, Sean? Uh, the only thing for me to pick on what Sherelle was uh, talking about with the, the recruiting. Uh, June 18th, the USA U-17 tryouts begin, uh, which has players from the 23 and 24 with a few 25 guys Gosh. sprinkled in. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is crazy to say. Uh, and I know it's kind of changed over the years in terms of uh, college coaches being, able, being allowed to go. I know Hubert was, I believe, at the U-18 tryouts in Houston before uh, before he went to watch some of the games in Tijuana. So I don't know if any of the coaches will be allowed there from a, from a UNC perspective. I was a little surprised. I didn't see Cam Scott or Stevenson on that, that invite list. Uh, I think the one player of note, Carter Knox, who uh, Sherelle has mentioned earlier, will be in that, that tryout phase. Um, and then that, that will actually, whoever makes the team, that will continue into early July 
So whoever makes that team, uh, they probably will, will be missing that first live period uh, in, the, in the July timeframe. Awesome. Good news, man. That's a, that's a nice little nugget to be throwing out there before we get out of here. Cheryl, anything else you want to add? Uh, two things. I'll say we'll be covering pretty much uh, the rest of the EVAL periods. So whether it be Scholastic, um, EYBL in Kansas City or Augusta or Adidas in Spartanburg or wherever, uh, we'll, we're kind of going to be on the road a lot. And that's, I would say, a month and a half. So there's that. And then the other thing, I hope I don't get in trouble, just randomly, <clears throat> I had a, dry, a long drive this weekend. And uh, Tate Frazier, who used to be an intern for Inside Carolina, mm-hmm. definitely a friend of the program, uh, did a, a podcast, The World of Five Star, about the five star camp with, with Howard Garfinkel. Think. And it is really good, man. Like, I, I, I've been meaning to get to it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to commit to this and listen to the whole thing. And it's really good. So, our audience, full of people who love recruiting, some great stories and, and things who things I didn't know. And I've been doing this for a while, um, just about how Five Star operated, some of the coaches, all that good stuff. Just great stories. I, w- I would highly recommend it to anyone. Um, it's definitely worth your time. Yeah, Five Star and Garfinkel have some legendary, you know, not just ties to to high school ball and prep ball, and, and, but just ties to culture and like how so many guys' stories started there. So, yeah, I absolutely heavily endorse that. And we want to give a big shout out to former IC intern Tate Fraser for that. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I didn't know Hubie Brown and Chuck Daly were like huge five star guys and were were basically um, they helped start it. Hubie Brown, uh, along with Chuck Daly, were some of the first ones to really get it going. I had no idea about that. Yep. uh, There's enough in there for you to to swell your head up and then uh, a couple more times just in in knowledge. And and again, like Sherelle said, stuff you you had no clue about. Um, So, yeah, definitely. That's that's a nice endorsement for for Tate's work there. Um, Guys, that's that that's pretty much the show. I mean, we've done a good, uh, a good 40 minutes here. I think it's probably uh, a good update for everybody. Hopefully folks listen to the show. will walk away feeling like they learned something and feel like they've, they've got their arms around the goings on, uh, around the Carolina basketball program and recruiting. And as always, if there's something else to report, we'll make sure we get it to you guys. Uh, and again, to reiterate, we appreciate you listening. Appreciate you being a part of the show. Uh, appreciate it. If you would subscribe, rate and review us, would appreciate it. If you would go patronize Johnny t-shirt because they support us. Uh, but most importantly, thanks for being here. Uh, for Sean Moran, for Cheryl McMillan, I'm Joey Powell. This has been the Coast to Coast Podcast on InsideCarolina.com, brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. Shout out to John Siegley for producing. We will talk to you guys sometime in the very, very near future.